We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, hello again, church. As we are, uh, I'm really excited about this series that we are in the middle of. How about you all? We're going through this... Uh, this period of time that we, we call the wander years as God has, has called his, his Israelites out of Egypt and we're kind of walking through that whole, uh, the, that season of, of wandering and, and uh, moving around and all that happens. And boy, could I tell you, man, if there were a Mount Rushmore of, of leaders, uh, you know, of, of, of pillars of, of, of the Christian faith, Without a doubt, I think Abraham would be on it, and I have no doubt Moses would be on it. I'm not quite sure who you would pick for the other two. There's a lot of great candidates, but Moses is one of those guys that when you read about his account and you read about his story and how God used him, it's an incredible account of, of faithfulness. Uh, but like all people in Scripture, you see these, these ups and down moments. Now, Moses, by the way, I want to give you kind of an idea of why Moses, I think, would be on the Mount Rushmore uh, of, of, of biblical characters, if you will. You know, he didn't even start his ministry until he was 80 years old. And then, right, he led God's people through this period that we're calling the wander years. He taught and led and all this for a period of 40 years. So some of you might think, ah, you know, at 80 years, he didn't even die until he was 120 and he was still leading God's people faithfully. Some of us in here, we get to a certain place where we're like, ah, I'm too old for that. Um, Moses, man, he, he was 80 when he started his ministry. He taught for 40 years. Man, with that kind of experience, you would think he could have written a book. And he did. Yeah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and, and Deuteronomy. He obviously didn't write the last part of Deuteronomy. If you read the last part, you'll understand why he couldn't have written that part. But he wrote this, this whole thing that we, we call it the, the, the Pentateuch, and the Jewish people call it the Torah. But it's basically these five books, the beginning books of your Bible, that really kind of give this uh, grand account that Moses put together for us. And a big part of it is this season that we're talking about called the Wander Years. And it's incredible. And there's a lot of ground to cover today. I mean, I, as we put together this series, we're thinking, how are we going to break this up? Today, we have all the way from Exodus 19 to Exodus 34 to cover. And that's what this, this that, here's what that means. You're going to have to go home and read this for yourself. Because there's no way I can show you and teach you everything that comes out of Exodus 19 to 34. But if we were to give this message a, a title and really kind of understand one thing we could glean from this. I, I, the way that I've titled this, this, this sermon, if you will, is the Laws and Forgetfulness. Uh, I, I guess Laws and Forgiveness. It's supposed to say forgetfulness, but I, uh, yeah, well, I, I probably typed it wrong. All right, so pretend it says Laws and Forgetfulness. In fact, our team is really, really <laughs> talented. There you go. I think there's just one L, though. Um, okay. But here it goes. Ready? I'll snap my finger, and we'll see that second L. Woo! All right. So, because we have a lot to accomplish today, there's really three things I'm going to kind of zoom in on. But by the way, can we just acknowledge for a moment, there's a whole team behind the scenes that is awesome at this church. We appreciate them so much. All right, so three things that if uh, handling this amount of uh, scripture, 
three things I want to do first is really give a quick overview, kind of that 30,000 foot view of what's happening in this section of scripture. And then secondly, we're going to zoom in on one section so that we can really glean something out of it. And then we're going to zoom out and see how this passage fits into the larger story of scripture. All right, so we're going to give an overview, we're going to zoom in, and we're going to zoom out. That's what we're going to do this morning. Let's start with the quick overview. You know, one of my favorite things as a pastor is getting to officiate weddings. There's something really special about seeing a a bride and a groom come together and that whole process of preparation and the the, the proposal and the counseling and then you get the the actual event and then the hearing about their plans for their honeymoon. There's just something really cool about being a pastor. I mean, pastors have to be there for like the, the, the really low moments of people's lives. And those weddings and those new babies, man, it makes it all worth it. There's something special about those high moments. And one of the things that people often do is they'll come up to their pastor and say, hey, uh, we're gonna get, we're, we wanna get married, we, we're, we're in love, and we wanna get married. And, and it's such an honor when someone says, and we would love for you to be the one to walk us through this process. Such a cool request. It's incredible honor. But what I want to show you is that we can really take this passage of Scripture and break it down into kind of the different parts of the preparation of and the actual wedding and post-wedding. It's kind of when, when God makes a covenant or, or makes a, a this, this it, you'll see that it kind of fits kind of like this, this marriage illustration. So for the sake of us understanding this passage, I've broken it down in that way, and I think it'll help us understand everything that goes on here. So here's the, the first part. It starts with a proposal, right? If you're going to get married, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to, uh, there's going to be a proposal. So two months after leaving Egypt, we're in Exodus 19. If you have a copy of God's word, go ahead and open up to Exodus 19. And you'll see that God initiates a covenant of sorts, uh, basically a proposal of sorts. And in Exodus 19, verse 3 is where we're going to start. And here's what it says. It says, Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So essentially what happens is God says to Moses, he offers what I would say is very similar to a proposal. He says, I want you to go and tell the people that that I want to make a a, a promise. I want to make this long-term commitment with them. And I want you to go ahead and offer that to them in the form of a question and see if they will receive that. That's essentially what a proposal is, right? When you make a proposal for marriage, you're essentially saying, you're, you're not actually making the promise at that moment. You're making a promise to make a promise with more information, Essentially, you're saying, listen, I'm willing to go through this process, and if everything pans out, then yes, I'll make the official promise. But for now, let's kind of consider this a, 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 a preliminary agreement. And then it says in verses 7 through 8, it says, So Moses returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded him. And all the people responded together. Are you ready for this? We will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. I love how it's worded. Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. It shows that God really offered a proposal. This covenant was offered in the form of a proposal, and the people said, yeah, I want to marry you. I want to do this. Let's do it. If you really look, if, if, how many times we're going to see in this passage of Scripture that the people say the phrase, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. If you're counting it, so far we're at number one. One time so far the people have said, yep, we want to do things God's way. We will obey. All right, so after the proposal, what happens next in this process is something called 
premarital counseling. Now, I don't know if you were able to get premarital counseling or not. I highly recommend it. One of the things we do at this church, we call it a SIMBIS, which is saving your marriage before it starts. That's what premarital counseling is. What can we give you? What can we help you? How can we give you all the information that you need so that when you make a promise in the future, you actually know what promise you're making. In fact, one of the most important parts of premarital counseling is we sit down and we go over all the nitty gritty, all the reasons why you might not want to make this promise, all the details, all the, uh, we, we dig into debt, we dig into expectations, we dig into all sorts of things, but specifically, we take a, a close look at those wedding vows. I want to make sure that you're not hearing those wedding vows for the first time up on this stage, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do whatever you just said. Let's look at the actual commitment before you make it so you have time to think about it and ponder it and consider it. So Exodus 19 goes on. And the people you see at the end of this chapter, they're preparing for this counseling process. They go through this preparation phase. And then it says something that I had to read a couple times myself. Do you realize that the first time the Israelites hear the ten, get the Ten Commandments, they're actually able, they're not able to see it. They're not able to see God with their own eyes. But God actually says to Moses, I'm going to make sure they can hear me. So they know this is coming from me and not from you. The people are able to hear God give Moses the Ten Commandments the first time with their own ears. They're part of this premarital counseling process. They're not allowed to see God. They have to stay at the bottom of the mountain. But then in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments are giving. This this is where you you find, if you've been in in the church for a while, you've probably heard of the Ten Commandments. Here's a a brief overview. I'm not going to put them on the screen, but it's, have no other gods before me. No graven images. That one's going to come back in just a moment. Uh, No taking the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath. Honor your parents. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. And don't covet. These Ten Commandments that are given to Moses. Right? And as these are given, you're going to notice as you read this passage on your own this week, or as you have already read this past week, it's all very dramatic. It says there's thunder, and there's lightning, and there's billows of smoke, and there's all sorts of shaking and all sorts of craziness going on. And and it's all very dramatic, and here's the reason why. When something's really important, you try to make it really dramatic, right? You don't just, you kind of, if something's important, you want it to be, you want lights to flash, and you want, you know, fireworks, right? And God's saying, listen, these vows are so important I want to make sure people hear, not only hear them, but know how important they are, that I'm going to make this a very dramatic experience. In fact, they're afraid. It says in Exodus 20, verse 20, it says, Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you, and so that you will fear, so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. God's putting all this flair around these Ten Commandments and this law very specifically and purposely to make sure you know how important it is. So they're in this premarital counseling phase, and and essentially, when I sit down with a couple, right, I'm sharing with them these vows. I'm showing them how important they are. Do you realize that this word right here, it says, until death do us part. Like, you, you want to make sure that everyone understands how important these words are. And that's what God is doing here with the covenant he's going to make with his people. And so Moses goes back up and he gets more instructions. And there's one instruction in particular that God goes out of his way to repeat. Remember in the Ten Commandments, we already know no other gods before me and no graven images. He said the no graven images already once in the form of the Ten Commandments. But he wants to now repeat something And he repeats something really specific. In Exodus 20, verse 22, it says, And then the Lord said to Moses, Say this to the people. Really what he's saying, because he's already said it. He says, Remind the people. Say this again. He says, Say this to the people. You saw for yourselves that I spoke to you from heaven. Remember, you must not make any idols of silver or gold to rival me. He goes out of his way 
to clarify that. In fact, he goes out of his way again. He says, listen, even when you're putting an altar together, you're probably going to want to take stones. And when you put those stones together to make something uh, for, for me, make sure you don't take those stones and carve them into images. Don't take those stones and paint things on them and chisel at them. I made the stones the way I want the stones to be. Don't make something else. Don't make some other image. Just worship me. He goes out of his way to make this really, really clear. Just like in premarital counseling, I go out of my way to make it really, really clear. This is a big deal. And then as Exodus 21 through 23 this is, a, again, a, a real quick overview. God provides Moses with 52 other detailed commandments. Just God and Moses are hearing in this premarital counseling process, okay, here's this, and don't forget about that, and make sure they include things about treatment of slaves and personal injury rules and property rights and social responsibility and festivals they're supposed to keep. And God really lays it all out there for Moses. Moses, take all this down. Make sure everybody knows the promise they're about to make is a serious one. And then it says... In Exodus 24, verse 3, it says, Then Moses went down to the people, and he repeated all of the instructions. So now they're getting the Ten Commandments again. They're getting 52 other commandments, right? There are 52 other uh, parts of the law, right? It says, Moses repeated all the instructions and regulations the Lord had given him. And all the people answered with one voice. You ready? We will do everything the Lord has commanded. There's, if you're keeping track, that's the second time now. Second time, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. They, they heard God say it. Yep, we're going to do it. Then, then Moses got more, and they got the premarital counseling, and he's been offered again. And they said, yep, we want to go through with this wedding. Let's make it happen. So after premarital counseling, right, we finally get to the wedding. We plan it, right? We put a date on the calendar, and we figure out, you know, we even rehearse it quickly before, you know, the day before, a couple days before, and we get together and we have the wedding. And that's where the promise is actually made and sealed. So in Exodus 24, we see that happen. It says, then Moses carefully wrote down all of the Lord's instructions. Remember, he already went down and shared all the Lord's instructions. Now he's carefully written them down. It says, then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to the people. Again, they all responded, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. That's number three. Now, here's what's a little bit different about this time. Now, it's all written down, right? Guess what? When I stand up here with a new couple, there's a groom standing right here and a bride standing right here, and I open up a book, and I read from my, my, my notes the vows. It's written down, and I say, listen, are you going to do this? And the groom says, I will. And I say to the bride, are you going to do this? And she says, I will. There's this agreement. There's a, a written down. I repeat it. I get this promise made to me and to God. You see, there's something really cool about a wedding. There's so much preparation that goes into it. There's, there's decorations and there's music that's selected and all sorts of, you know, outfits and flowers and a reception and all sorts of incredible parts of this whole thing. But there's something incredibly special about that moment where a vow is made. Like really, that's all that matters if you really boil it down. You could get rid of the rest. In fact, I've, I've had instances in my ministry where someone's like, we just want to get married. Can we do it today? We got a license. Yeah, we just need a promise and a promise and then I sign something that, to me, isn't as important. The state thinks that's important. So I sign something. You know, ultimately, the vow is kind of where the magic happens. That's that, that, that promise of the wedding. And then you notice that when there's a wedding, that the promise is sealed in some way. It's usually sealed. Sometimes people would say it's been sealed with a piece of paper. You know, you get some certificate that shows that it's been sealed. Maybe it's been sealed with a kiss. You know, hey, you can now seal the deal with a kiss. Sometimes you might consider it sealed with a ring, like a, a, a symbol of the promise that you've made. But ultimately, you understand that the promise is sealed. And we see this in Exodus 24, 
verse 8. It says, Then Moses took the blood from the basins and splattered it over the people, declaring, Look, this blood confirms the covenant the Lord has made with you in giving you these instructions. So what we see happen is Moses confirms. He, he seals the deal with, with this blood. And then what happens after a wedding, right? The best, the best most, well, not the best part, but the, the fun part. The reception, right? You have a party afterwards. And essentially, we see a reception happen next in this as well. If you look at Exodus 24, 9 through 11, it says, In Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel climbed up the mountain. There they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there seemed to be a surface of brilliant blue somethings, as clear as the sky itself. And though these nobles of Israel gazed upon God, he did not destroy them. Get this, it says, in fact, they ate a covenant meal, eating and drinking in his presence. That is essentially what a reception is. It's a covenant meal. It's a time to sit down and to enjoy and celebrate the fact that a promise has been made. And we see this reception right here. And then what happens after the reception, right? The bride and groom, this is probably their favorite part. They get in a limo maybe and they head off to a honeymoon somewhere, right? They head off for some time alone. And essentially, we're going to see a version of that here in Scripture as well. Now, I know uh, my honeymoon, I, 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 I wouldn't say I pulled a fast one because everyone knew what was, what was going on, all right? But I lived in Virginia. My wife and I, we got married in Delaware, and we wanted to honeymoon in Lake Tahoe. But I was 21 years old, and I was broke. So I'm like, how do I get my, my I got this resort that's all covered, but I got to somehow pay for plane tickets. Well, I was working for Liberty University at the time. And I went up to my, my supervisor there, and I was like, hey, so I know I got this honeymoon planned, but I'd be willing to work one of the days of my honeymoon to do this special uh, admissions recruitment event in California if you would be willing to fly me out there to do it. And they're like, deal, done, right? So I got to fly me and a, a, a companion, my wife, right? I, I picked her. It made sense. And we... Um, <laughs> We flew and did this recruitment event just one day of our honeymoon. I had to work, but it covered our plane tickets. It made a ton of sense. We had this beautiful uh, honeymoon in Lake Tahoe. It was an incredible experience. But ultimately, right, Moses now gets to go and kind of spend this alone time. There's this covenant, this promise that's been made. It's been celebrated. There's been a reception. And we get to this place called the honeymoon. In Exodus 24... Thank you, guys. You guys are going so quick with me. I, th I feel like we're all, we're all keeping up. Exodus 24, verses 12 through 15, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain. Stay there, and I will give you the tablets of stone on which I have inscribed the instructions and commands so that you can teach the people. So Moses and his assistant Joshua set out, and Moses climbed up the mountain of God. Moses told the elders, stay here and wait for us until we come back. Aaron and Hur are here with you. If anyone has a dispute while I am gone, consult with them. In other words, he says, listen, I leave you in capable hands. That's going to come back to bite him. And then Moses climbed up the mountain and the cloud covered it. You know what happens after a honeymoon is that you, you move in together. Right? You start life together. And essentially what happens is Moses is up in the mountain. God is giving out very detailed instructions on how they are now going to live together. It's essentially, as you read it, you see very clear instructions. As Exodus 25 all the way through Exodus 30, God is giving very detailed instructions of how the Israelites and God can coexist together. 
Essentially what he's doing is he gives out these very detailed instructions for this structure called the tabernacle. He's like, listen, there's going to be a tabernacle, and in the tabernacle there's going to be another space, and in that space there's going to be another space, and in that space. And he gives very detailed instructions for this Ark of the Covenant that is going to be inside the, that innermost space called the Holy of Holies. And he's like, and this is how you're going to build it, and this is the material you're going to use, and this is, and there's just a ton of detail, and I encourage you to go and read it for yourself. One, a couple things I want to point out about all this. A little side notes, if you will. Number one, if, if you notice that when you read through these detailed instructions, a lot of the, the symbolism and the imagery that is being given and used points back to the Garden of Eden. Essentially, what God is doing is symbolically saying, listen, you guys screwed up the whole Garden of Eden thing, but I'm creating a way for a little portable Eden where I can dwell with you in, a, in not the way I used to, but in some way we can live together. And he gives these detailed instructions. Here's another a little side note I want to make sure we all notice. Is notice that God gives very detailed instructions. He doesn't just do that because he's, he's nitpicky. right? He, he gives very detailed instructions for how we are to create a, a place where we can dwell together and where we can worship him fully. And here's, here's what I wanted to take away from that. I wrote it down because I, I, I was thinking, how do I say this the right way? And here, here's what I want to make sure you know. It is not our job to decide how we want to worship God. It is our job to learn how God wants to be worshiped and then to worship him that way. You understand? It is not our job to figure out how we would like to worship God. It is our job to figure out, listen, God, you have very detailed instructions for how you'd like us to create a place where we can worship you and we can dwell and live together. I want to figure out what that is, and I want to make that happen in my life. I want to worship you the way you desire to be worshiped. And we can glean all of that from Exodus 25 through 30. Then Exodus 31 goes on, and he says, listen, there's some very special artisans who are very gifted amongst you that can make all these things happen. And we hear about that. Certain people have been selected for certain jobs. And then this happens in verse 18 of chapter 31. It says, when the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. Here's what's really interesting. Remember, Moses already heard the terms of the covenant. It says Moses wrote them all down in a book. At the wedding, right, Moses kind of read them all, and everybody said, yes, we will agree. There's something extra special now. God's saying, listen, come up here, and instead of you having the book of the covenant in your handwriting, I want you to have it in my handwriting. And he gives them two and most biblical scholars actually, we understand that these were on both sides they were inscribed, and it probably wasn't half on this one and half on this one. It was the entire covenant over here and the entire covenant over here. You get a copy and one's for me. This is a promise. This is a big deal. And Moses gets these, uh, these, these tablets. And then... Chapters 32 through 34, essentially what we're going to see is that God's new bride, don't miss this, cheats on their honeymoon. Man, if you're, there's never a good time to cheat on your vows, right? It's always a bad time to cheat on your vows. But on your honeymoon? Moses is up there spending some alone time with God for 40 days and 40 nights. And what we're about to now do is I want to zoom in for the second part. We got our overview. and I haven't really finished the rest of it, so we're going to zoom in on the, this last part. And I want you to understand that there's a takeaway we can see here as the bride cheats on their honeymoon. In Exodus 32, we're going to read the first six verses. This, here's what it says. It says, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, 
they gathered around Aaron. Remember Aaron's the guy that Moses says, listen, if you have any questions or issues, go to Aaron. They gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. <laughs> Remember, we will obey. We will do it God's way. We will obey. We will do it God's way. Third time, we will obey. We will do it God's way. Moses is up on the mountain. It hasn't even been 40 days, and they're already saying, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from this land of Egypt. So Aaron says, take the gold rings from your ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. And all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. It's almost sickening to read, isn't it? I mean, we were just re- we were singing a song just a moment ago saying, God, you know, one song, you brought me out of Egypt. I'm never going to bail on you, right? You're my everything. We sang that lyric. God, you're, you're my everything. These people just sang the exact same song that we sang this morning. And here they are now saying, look at this gold calf. This, this represents the gods who brought us out of Egypt. What, what promise? I don't remember making a promise. Then it goes on. It says, Aaron saw how excited the people were. So he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. Oh, how quickly we forget. Oh, how quickly we come on a Sunday morning and sing songs saying, God, I'm going to do things your way. You're my everything, God. And we walk out of these doors, and oh, how quickly we forget about the promise we just made the commitment that was just real in our hearts just moments ago. Remember that second commandment? No idol or graven images. The people said, sounds good. In Exodus 20, remember, you must not make any idols of gold or silver to rival me. He goes out of his way to repeat it, and they say, yep, got it. And he says, remember, not even, don't even carve something into the rocks. And they're like, yep, got it. Exodus 24, they, Moses says it all again, and they say, uh-huh. And then Exodus 24 again, he reads it out of a book, and they all say, yep, Oh, how quickly we forget. Multiple times. Moses comes back down from the mountain to see all this happening. And he's so mad at what he's seeing. It says that he throws the tablets and breaks them. Throws them on the ground and they break. Throws them in anger and they break. Then he destroys the idol, grinds it into dust, and makes the people drink it. Aaron goes on and lies. He says, I don't know, we just put this gold in the fire and this calf came out. A bunch of people are killed. Then Moses intercedes on their behalf, but there's still a punishment of a plague amongst the people of Israel. I know I just covered a ton of things, but here's the takeaway. Four things, real quick, I'm not gonna talk about each one, just four things. If you're taking notes, these are the four things I want you to to glean from this, zoom in, okay? Number one, you were made to worship. It's part of your wiring. You can't get around it. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you are worshiping something else. If you are a follower of Jesus, you ought to be worshiping Jesus, but oftentimes we find ourselves forgetful and we end up worshiping other things. You were made to worship. Second, therefore, you will worship. You're gonna worship something. Thirdly, worshiping the wrong things brings consequences. When you find yourself worshiping something other than what you're supposed to worship, it is going to bring consequences into your life. And the fourth thing, therefore, is daily check your heart to make sure you are worshiping God alone. That's your takeaway for this morning. So here's the the last thing I want to talk about is I want to zoom out real quick. I want to make sure we understand what the purpose of this passage is in the wider understanding of Scripture. 
See, Moses only had a a particular moment in time to understand this law, but we now have the whole Old Testament. We have the life of Jesus in the Gospels, and we zoom out even further than that, and we have the account of the early church, and we understand now a bigger purpose of the, the law. In fact, the way I would really want to ask the question is, what is the purpose of the law, and why did God give it? How many of you have seen um, the Beverly Hillbillies? Some in this room. I'm reminded of a scene where they're moving into their new mansion, they're moving into their new home, and there's a few things they've never seen before, so they don't quite understand what they are, and one of those things is the billiard table. You remember this? They go into that room, the billiard table room, and immediately it's the, the fancy eating table. And they can't wait to have a fancy meal at the fancy eating table. In fact, they take the pool cues, right, and notch little divots in them, and they're the pot passers. So they can pass the pots around, right? They don't quite understand what these pool cues are, these billiard cues, or what the billiard table is. And essentially, right, if we don't understand the purpose of the law, if we don't understand why God gave it and what the, how it fits into the bigger picture of the gospel and the church, we won't quite understand how it benefits, fully benefits us today. So let me share with you four quick verses about how the law fits into the New Testament understanding of the gospel and the church. In Galatians 3, it says this, why then was the law given? I love how we're trying to answer this question and Paul writes to the church in Galatia, he asks the exact same question, why then was this law given to Moses? And here's the answer. It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the one who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. And if you keep Actually, I guess you have to go backwards in your New Testament to Romans 3, verse 20. It says, "For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands." The law simply shows us how sinful we are. My family and I, we play this game. Uh, some of you in the in the youth group might have learned this game from my kids. It's called uh, silent football. Silent football, you sit in a circle and there's, the way the game is designed, there's so many rules, an endless almost amount of rules, that the game has been designed so that people will accidentally break a rule because they'll forget that it's one of the rules. The law has been given in such a way as to say, listen, there's just so much that there's no way you sinful people can keep all these things. And it's been given in a way to show you, listen, there's no way you're going to be able to live up to this expectation of righteousness. There's no way. You are a sinner. And the law kind of puts that truth into light. You can't keep all these rules. I mean, just take a few of the, just the Ten Commandments. Don't add the other 52 and all the other, you know, 600. Like, just take just some of the the Ten Commandments and think how often we go about our day messing those things up. I have 42 years of experience messing those things up, and you do too. In the Romans 7, it says, I have discovered this principle of life. This is Paul, right? And a pillar, a pillar of the church. This is what Paul says. I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. And then John 1, 17 says, For the law was given through Moses... But God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. You see, there's something to understand about the beauty of the gospel. We have the benefit now of seeing that this law was given to point out to each and every one of us 
that we are desperately in need of a Savior because we cannot live a righteous life in and of ourselves. And what God says is that he sent his son who was able to keep the entirety of the law. He was able to obey all the commandments of the law. He was able to live without sinning. And that because of Jesus, we have this access to this thing called the gospel, the good news, that by putting our faith in Jesus, by by trusting Jesus, Jesus' perfectness, his righteousness, the fact that he totally kept the law, his record of law-keeping could be ascribed to each of us in the church who have placed our faith in him. That's how this understanding of the law fits into our understanding of, you know, listen, there's, there's this big old law, and we are a forgetful people. We sing one song that says, God, you are my everything. You kept me, you took me out of Egypt and into the promised land, and now I'm going to do everything your way. And we sing that song, and I'm not telling you to stop singing that song. Man, sing that song and let that be an anthem that reminds you that that's what you're pursuing. You're trying to live that kind of life. You're working towards becoming that kind of a follower of Jesus. But the truth is, there is a law, and we are super forgetful, and we mess up all the time. And therefore, we desperately need Jesus Christ. You see, the law is not the answer. The law points to the answer. The law points to Jesus. Listen, if you're in Sunday school and the teacher asks a question, the answer is always what? Jesus. That's not really true. Probably 80% of the time it is. Jesus is the answer that the law points to. So here's our what now. Here's my challenge for each of us today. And it's simply that, that fourth step, which is to daily check your heart to make sure you are worshiping God alone. Daily check your heart to make sure you are worshiping God alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for taking us out of Egypt. You brought us out of slavery to sin. You brought us out of this place where we were oppressed by the world. And while we still are at war in our minds and we still long to to slip back into this oppressive state of sinfulness, we know that at the same time you're tugging us and longing for us to live with you forever in this promised land. And we find ourselves right now here in this wilderness. God, I pray that you would allow the law to be something that reminds us how desperately we need you and not only reminds us of how much we need you. God, if there's someone in this room that, that still needs you, that they would, God, I pray that they would give their life to you today. But for those of us who already know how desperately we need you, have already committed to following you in your way, God, I pray that you would help us every day to work on making sure that our hearts are worshiping you and not anything else. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.